Good evening. Evening. I think I got a bad title for this. Uh, I preached a sermon a couple months ago, Things We Must Know, and I entitled this one, Things We Must Know Two, as a second part, but really what I should have taught and titled it was Things We Must Know for Certain. That it would have been a better title, but uh, we'll go with what we've got and not worry about it too much. First Peter chapter 4, verse 11, Peter writes, Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. And that's kind of like one part of that, that verse. And the idea is that if we're going to be talking, teaching, preaching, whatever, we should do so as one who speaks the oracles of God, particularly if we're talking about Bible things. Uh, make sure that we're giving the message of God as God would have us to deliver it. We're always trying to make sense of God's, the message of God's word, and often we use examples that come from everyday life, right? Because that's what Jesus did, that's what Paul did, that, that's the way the Bible writer, you know, that's how, writers, that's how it's put together. So there's no real problem with this, seeing that the Bible is full of such examples. Still, we have to be careful to assure that the examples are correlated to the distinct, noble, viable, or verifiable truth of the scriptures. There's got to be something there that's truth, not just one point that it, it looks like it's the truth, but that it is the truth of the scriptures. Now having said that, we can know certain things from the Bible for certain. Certain things from the Bible for certain, like Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. The secret things belong to God, the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Do you realize there are over 2,000, thus says the Lord, statements in the Old Testament? Just in the Old Testament, not, not counting the New Testament, in the Old Testament. Like Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Now this is when Abraham, uh, the, the man of faith, the father of the faithful, the one who was willing to leave one of the most modern cities of his day, Ur of the Chaldees, and take his family and go live in the backwaters of Canaan. <laughs> you know, it's like going to the desert and where there's hardly anything. Uh, uh, this man of faith and the Lord is telling him, know this for certain, that your family is going to go to a land, be servants, be slaves, uh, and they're going to be afflicted that, that way for about 400 years. Yeah, that's, how's that good? <laughs> how's that a hopeful thing? Well, but it came to pass because the Lord is certain about what he says. In Joshua chapter 23 and verse 13, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. Joshua is warning the children of Israel, hey, God said he would give us the promised land. But when he said he'd give us the promised land, he said, you go in and take it. He just didn't give us to us. We had to go in. We had to do something. We had to take it. And we've taken so much of it. And now there's some parts of it that's left. And God's not going to just take these people out. You've got to continue to do it. It's up to you. Now, of course, we know they didn't do it, and it caused them problems later on. But that's the same thing in our lives, right? God isn't going to do it all for us. 
there are certain things we have to do. But notice the wording there. Know for certain that the Lord your God will, and whatever. So God will do so much. God will do his part. But it, it, it's like, you know, if you're raising kids, okay, uh, you know, clean your room. Oh, I, I won't clean my room because I know if I just don't do it, mom and dad will do it for me later. You know, something like that. You know, whatever. You know, it's, no, God isn't like that. God will do his part, but he expects us to do our part. Job 19, verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the, the last he will stand upon the earth. Well, how did Job know that? except that God told him. How would he know that he needed a redeemer? How did he know that his redeemer was then living, living at the time that Job was living, and that he would stand at last on the earth in the last days, and in the beginning of the Christian era, we would say, the Christian age as we've talked about. How did Job know that unless the Lord had told him? And it's like, he can know that for certain. Psalm 67, verse 2, that your way, that's the Lord's way, may be known on earth your saving power among all nations. God's way is supposed to be made known. God's way is supposed to be told to everybody. And that doesn't mean everybody's going to listen, but it means we've got to get that word out there, and it doesn't matter who it's to. God wants that message told. Because the secret things belong to God. But the things God's revealed to us, we want to get those revealed to others. The New Testament also speaks of objective truths, and we know the difference, right? Uh, subjective truth is I think, I feel, I intuit, I sense. But an objective truth is, hey, I see this very plainly here. You know, my, my uh, what am I going to believe? What you're telling me or my eyes, you know? Because uh, I see something very plainly, you know? Uh, there's no elephant in this room. Yeah, there's an elephant sitting back there. Now, what are you going to believe? What you don't see? <laughs> what somebody tells you. Well, there's an objective truth to what Jesus, the Lord, is telling us. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, now notice that they had believed him, but they were beginning to turn away because some of the things that Jesus said was hard to understand, but it was also hard to put into practice because if they put it into practice, you know what that meant? They'd be scorned by their fellow Jews. They, they, they would come under scrutiny and they would be persecuted he said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Not Moses' disciples. Not, uh, we'll use some examples here, and not Nicodemus's disciples, not somebody else's disciples. You'll be my disciples if you abide in my word. But if you will abide in my word, paraphrasing some there, verse 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Not you will know a truth, and a truth will set you free. You will know the truth, objective, one truth, one set of facts that, that is solid, evident, evidentiary truth. You can count on it, you can bank on it. And how do we know that? Well, because it comes from the Lord. It come from, comes from God, the Son, who helped create this whole universe, this world, spoke it into existence. So, Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, that being the apostles mainly, 
but even Paul and Barnabas and Timothy and Silas thereafter Barnabas and Paul went different ways Silas goes with him you have Luke who's with him at times you have all those people that are with Paul and preaching the gospel uh, if, if somebody preaches a gospel contrary to that let him be accursed as we have said before so now I say again if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you you Galatians received let him be accursed now people will take that today well I grew up in this church so I've got to stay with the the gospel I heard in this particular church no you got to go back to what the Bible says the gospel is because that's what Paul preached and the Apostles preached and all those people who were with Paul preached and and what Peter preached uh, you know Peter talks about the Word of God so it's not just what you heard it's what the Bible teaches and if what you heard is not what the Bible teaches what the New Testament teaches then what you heard and the people who taught you that are to be accursed that's not a good thing is it that, that's not at all so uh, how would I know the difference what well, you've got to look at it you've got to see if there's a difference between what the scripture says and what your church teaches and if there's a difference you need to go with what the scripture says plain and simple now suppose the Bible was filled with subjective thoughts and opinions wouldn't that be something now, how would people be able to know anything about God or a godly lifestyle or or about how to be saved think of Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6 and he said the Lord said I think I'm the God of your father the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob I want you to think that I am the God of your father the God of Abraham uh, you know I, I might be but you just have to guess at it the give you too much confidence there does it first Samuel chapter 15 verse 3 now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have if you feel like it now if you don't feel like it don't worry about it you know let them live <laughs> God what do you want me to do well, if you feel like it, go do this or go do that. You know, do whatever you want to do. And, and that's, the, that's the gospel that some people believe, isn't it, today? I just do what I want to do. Mark chapter 6, verse 18, For John had been saying to Herod, It is a bad idea for you to have your brother's wife. Uh, no. What? It's unlawful for you to have your brothers. Well, who made that law? <laughs> so, well, somebody who wasn't married, right? <laughs> so, you go into a lot of different areas with that. Hmm. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. When, you know, after the the uh, men at Pentecost say, men and brethren, what must we do? Peter said to them, do whatever you want to do. Just say, it is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just whatever. Yeah. Acts 17.30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he suggests all people everywhere repent. That sounds so yeah, I like the the uh, 
some of the jokes that nighttime comedians used to talk about, you know, that uh, it used to be the Ten Commandments, now we treat them like the Ten Suggestions. Yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, when Moses, the, the one I really like, the, Moses comes down from the mountain and you know, and the people say, well, how did it go, Moses? Moses says, I got good news and I got bad news. Oh, what's the good news? I talked him from, down from 11 to 10 commandments. Oh, what's the bad news? Adultery's still in there. <laughs> you know, it's, but you see how the subjective nature of things could, you just have no idea. And that's the way people want to address the scriptures, like you cannot know anything. So that it's all subjective. It's just whatever you want to do and, and whatever makes you feel good. And uh, some of the material I've been looking at in a philosophical sense deals with the way people look at things. And you, you go from reason to, to feelings and and you have, uh, uh, I forget what, and, and intuition, and, and you know, just, there's, you have opposite, we have all those things, you have an emotional component and, and such, but at some point, you've got to use reason if you want to know the truth. You just can't intuit reason. You know, you deal with well, young people, you deal with and say, oh, how do you know that? Oh, I just know it. You know, I just know things. Well, they don't. They, they're just repeating things that they heard. you probably heard of artificial intelligence. There's no such thing as artificial intelligence. Okay? Because even if a computer could carry on a conversation with you, it's just because of an algorithm that somebody put in that computer. It's, it's not artificial at all. It's not coming up with its own thoughts to carry on that conversation. So, reason, that's what makes man different. That's what makes man like God. Is that, and, and the discussion that we had in Bible class today, a, a, a lot of that goes back to this is why we are created in the image of God. Is that reasoning process and maybe perhaps why the Bible is laid out like it is that you don't get it in lumps like the book of Isaiah says, here a little and there a little, line upon line, line upon line, uh, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Why? Because God expects us to do something. He expects us to think and to reason out these things. Here are some things that we can be sure of or be certain of. All right, and these elements are uh, these are elements of the faith for which we should earnestly contend. Jude chapter one verse three. All right, contend earnestly for the faith once delivered. Oh, well, if God has delivered it to us, the secret things belong to God. But what God has delivered to us, what God has given to us, there for us to do what? to reason about, and also to contend for, all right? So, how about the length of days? And I talked about this not too long ago. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. So if light lasted 
thousands or millions of years like some people tell us. Oh, really, that was an, a, a, an age, you know, that was a long time. If a day lasted how, that many millions, or thousands or millions of years, the earth would burn up, at least frozen, because it would be night there. So there'd be no life on anywhere. Life couldn't exist. We need a 24-hour day. The physical aspects of Earth life ensure the viability of life on Earth. That's a part of creation science. Uh, as you look at it, the evidence, the Christian evidences that are there, the Earth is just the right distance from the Sun. The Moon is just the right distance from the Earth. And the orbits for the seasons and such, the way you know, the, the, yeah, as it sits on its axis, but, but also for the seasons, how that, you know, we track up and we track down. So you have a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere. It, it's just a wonderful thing. If we were closer to the sun, we would burn up. If we were further away, we'd freeze. We're designed for life here on this earth. Designed and designed design implies a designer. Uh, how about Jesus Christ was born of a virgin? Can we be sure of that? But what would be your evidence? How about prophecy and testimony? Right? Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 and Isaiah was written 700 years before Christ was born. 700 years. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, all this took place to, fit, to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. You have the prophecy and you have the testimony of it. And, and even if you didn't quite believe totally the testimony, the life of Jesus demands that you look at it and accept that part of the testimony. Now, again, the Old Testament, people say, well, you, you know, virgin there, just, that just, that's a word that just means a young maid. That doesn't necessarily mean a virgin, right? But you come to the New Testament, the word virgin there, you know what that means? That means a virgin, a woman that's not known a man. So the Bible, the New Testament part there, makes comment on and tells you exactly what the Old Testament meant. How about Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrected? We can know that for certain, can't we? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 through 8. The Apostle Paul writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures. If I go on, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Don't you could you just imagine that they sat around reading the Old Testament because they were writing the New Testament at that time. But can't you imagine that as they were studying the Scriptures, every time they came upon something in the Old Testament that we call today, what they call the writings, the Scriptures, every time they came on something that had to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, look at that! There it is again! In the Old Testament. There's a prophecy of it. And he's talking about it here. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Verse 5, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. What does that mean? You can go down there and you can talk to them yourself if you don't believe me. And they'll tell you. 
though some of them have fallen asleep. Verse 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all. And all means what? All. All. Doesn't mean last of everybody back then. Means last of all. As to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Paul saw the resurrected Jesus. Evidence. Evidence there. Evidence that we can trust, evidence that we can believe. We can know how we are saved. Notice I got the how in capital letters up there. So I'm emphasizing in this part how we can know how we are saved. Number one, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So how are we saved? We're saved by grace. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever... Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So how are we saved? We're saved by grace through faith, and that faith causes us to do what? To seek him. How do we seek him? Oh, well, by studying, by searching, by believing for sure. Uh, we see that the grace is God's part, and faith is man's part of how we are saved. But we can also know what we must do to be saved. And those are two separate things in the scriptures. And I know there are people that get that messed up. And they want to have the do part be in the how part. Right? And there are some who want the do part to be, or the how part to be in the do part then they think they're saved by works. And that's what the Pharisees, you know, they, they thought they were saved by works. But it's not that way. We can also know what we must do to be saved. Acts chapter 17, verse 30, we talked about that just a little while ago. But uh, in the times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. What do I have to do? I've, I've got to repent, right? Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. Uh, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. I've got to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. If, I don't, if I'm not willing to do that, he will deny me. And 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, let me tell you something. Okay? Just between you and me and the camera sitting over there. Okay? We talked about premillennialism today. And how that, if you put that template over certain passages in the scriptures, you can say, well, hey, that, that looks like that makes sense, right? Right? It, it looks like it. People who believe that mainly believe that baptism doesn't save you. How in the world can they look at this and put their template of you are saved by faith alone? That baptism is what you do after you're saved. How can they look at... Now listen, if they can't get this right, what makes you think they can get premillennialism right? See what I'm saying? How can you trust them on that if just the pl very plain statement of Scripture they can't get right? Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. 
not putting away, or not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Who do you trust? Why do you put your trust in certain people? See? Listen to what all they say. You say, listen, if they, if they can't see that, I don't see how they could see this other stuff in, in here. And something that is a little more difficult. So in conclusion, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, the first part of that, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Most people in this world are lost and do not know how to respond to God's invitation of grace. We know that, we understand that, but more than ever they need to know what God's word says about salvation. Not what men think about salvation, not what people think the Bible says about salvation, actually what the scriptures say, what the oracles of God say about salvation. We can know those things for sure. And we can repeat those things for sure. And like Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, we don't have to be ashamed of it. Because we can go right to verses like 1 Peter 3.21 and say, like figure, where baptism now saves us. Because that's what the gospel says. That's what the scriptures say. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. If you have need, let your question be made known as we stand and sing.